Hi, and welcome to the Library 2035, Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries webcast series. My name is Sandy Hirsch, and I'm the editor of this book. I'm pleased to host this webcast series featuring several of the book's contributing authors who will share their vision for libraries over the next decade. Today, I welcome Raymond Pund and Tarita Anantashai, co-authors of Chapter 16, Collaborative Collections and Content Considerations in Research and Academic Libraries, Possible Pathways by 2035. Ray Pun, the academic uh, and research librarian, is the academic and research librarian at the Alder Graduate School of Education. He previously worked at Stanford University, Fresno State University, New York University, Shanghai, and the New York Public Library. He is past president of the Asian Pacific American Libraries Association and past president of the Chinese American Libraries Association. Tarita Anantashai is the Director, Inclusion and Talent Management at the North Carolina State University Libraries. She previously worked in a number of public service oriented and leadership positions and in the academic publishing industry. Her research and professional interests include equity, diversity and inclusion, career development and mentoring, leadership and outreach and programming. Throughout chapter 16, Ray Pun and Trita Anantashai explained um, de and developments that they expect to see within research and academic libraries. They note some of the key challenges are incorporating and managing multiple types of collections, ensuring interoperability across systems of shared collections, and doing so with constrained budgets. Resource sharing systems will be necessary to expand the library's collections, and this means that effective partnerships will need to be established. They advocate for effective policies that can address these challenges and suggest that their work in scholarly communications and open access will grow in importance. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome Raymond Pund and Tarita Anantashai. Welcome. Thanks so much, Sandy, for having us here. Yes, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, great. Well, I am excited to start our conversation. Um, my first question is to ask you to briefly describe what your vision is for the future of libraries in 2035. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off first. I think it's a good question and one that requires thinking about how do things happen in the future. So in order for things to happen in the future, you need structure, you need infrastructure, you need something that sustains access to resources in a way that we typically aren't um, really thinking about right now as much, or we're, we're in conversations. And that means, for instance, thinking about how librarians select and make collections accessible, partnering with vendors, consortiums, distributors. And there's gonna be more of that um, development because it's one thing, when things are in print, but now we're seeing more digital collections that need to be diverse, reflective of our community's interests, especially in the academic research context and preservation of them. So we're talking about the transition of different resources and materials. Maybe that's even data. How do you ensure that what you get from a data set in one database to be used from Excel can be trans transferred over to some other project or program you're using? So we're thinking about interoperability. So there's a lot of these questions that I am thinking about in the future that we um, can create a platform in the academic and research libraries. But we also need to think in terms of money. And it also, it's about the time, the labor, the values, and the commitment. And how do you not create new things, but rather work in, in, in symphony, right? To ensure that the infrastructure provides seamless access to resources. Because at the end, we really want to ensure and, and I'm being hopeful here that there's digital equity. Yeah, and it's funny because um, I think a lot of what I'll say may echo what um, uh, Ray mentioned here, that I think, you know, one of the themes that also came up in our piece, um, which I hope we'll continue to see even more of in the future, is thinking increasingly more collectively rather than individualistically across libraries and library systems. Um, so like collaborative and collective organizing can certainly help us to better advocate as a, a, a unified, powerful voice for the types of systems we want to be building for ourselves. So like the infrastructures, like Ray mentioned, 
and the knowledge and the knowledge creation that we can elevate and support in the process, um, particularly those that reflect our espoused values for inclusion, equity, and accessibility. Um, we always already have a number of great partnerships and consortial uh, relationships and cross-institutional initiatives in place. Um, so I'd like to um, optimistically also think that building upon that even more and being really mindful about how we do so um, can help us to better support our patrons and ourselves as a profession and enhance access to different collections and forms of knowledge more broadly. So, Great. Thank you both for uh, sharing that. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about, as we look into the future, uh, what, what are you most concerned about? Maybe, um, Tarita, would you like to go first for this one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, certainly, I think we're seeing a period of very rapid growth and opportunity in our libraries, both in terms of technologies and infrastructure, like Ray mentioned earlier. But I think I'm also generally interested and concerned about the people behind these systems. And I don't say concerned as a synonymous um, version of worried, per se, um, but just more in how I truly hope that as we are building our systems, software and tools, um, but even the everyday workflows and processes um, that we need in the future, that we're also investing in our people. Um, not only to build their own skills so we can do so, but also in um, to help them find fulfilling growth opportunities themselves more personally as our libraries continue to shift and grow. Um, but also who will get these growth opportunities and then... Um, then to build these technical infrastructures and make the impactful decisions and have the power and influence um, within our libraries and who might not be afforded or who might encounter barriers for those opportunities, right? Um, and then how will that also affect the systems that are developed and maybe even held up as benchmarks in our field? Um, and how will that influence and dictate our libraries and our profession um, more at large? Um, somewhat relatedly, um, the systems were created, are created by people and people fundamentally hold their own biases. And so while I think there's been a lot more attention um, being paid to topics around bias um, and trying to mitigate that, um, the fact remains is that they continue to show up in how we're um, designing our interfaces, how we're developing our collections, right? Um, and, you know, even things like artificial intelligence, how that continues to troublingly um, reflect stereotypes, bias, and at times will generate or lead people to content content that can be actively harmful. Um, so I think that's also why we need to be really careful um, about the cultural competence and humility um, that we should hopefully um, also be bringing into our work and how we're building our collections and our access to them. <laughs> yeah, to follow up on that, thank you, Tarita. That was really great that there are a couple of issues that I'm seeing that we, we didn't get into as much uh, in, in this chapter, but I, it's connected. So one thing that has come up is there's a lot of new systems and considerations, as uh, Tarita mentioned. And, and that might mean thinking about, uh, unfortunately, th this is what's been happening. There's this outsourcing of a lot of services and, and labor that's been appreciated, the expertise, like in technical service. And I think we're going to see more of that uh, and to a certain extent because uh, libraries are, are, especially academic research libraries, are going through a lot of changes. Enrollment, budget, state level, considerations, federal level. And so that means prioritizing strategically how, what, what you can do within the libraries that, um, and, and, and fortunately, there, there's going to be um, some level of outsourcing, even using artificial intelligence tools. That's another way of um, complementing your work, but also in some ways um, outsourcing some type of other work. And I, we're beginning to see one thing that I um, have been concerned about is um, legislative issues that are reacting or slowly catching up, especially AI regulations that are maybe not as um, not as there yet, but by then maybe there'll be something. But one thing that stood out that that I would have um, wanted to, to talk more, but in, in the chapter, but we can certainly mention it now, is the idea of how there's going to be more eBooks, more usage for that more need, but how eBooks are, are sort of being used in different ways to, um, I, I don't want to say surveil, but rather just used as a way to monitor, right, how, the usage count. But it, there's a surveillance component to it that I'm seeing more. And I wonder if legislation will um, enact some, some ways, some guardrails around that issue. But in terms of all of that connecting to access, it really is about the people. And is our library schools and information science schools preparing the next generation to develop these skills in, in data repository management, in, in these digital skills, in um, cultural humility practices, as Tarita mentioned. I think that that 
I, we're hopeful that, that there will be more of that in the curriculum in LIS programs too, because it prepares them for these um, opportunities that, that, that's gonna be needed in the workforce. Thank you both. On the flip side, I'd like to ask you to reflect on what you are most excited about for the future of libraries. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll start off first and then um, wanted to say about the thinking, future thinking of resource sharing. So I, I feel that there is something um, really promising. Um, we know that resource sharing has been around since the quote unquote ancient period where people have been sharing books, right? And that's what that's what we do a lot. But, but COVID-19 and, and maybe even the past pandemics, right, uh, have accelerated the opportunity to collaborate across different libraries and, and signaling to the workers in the, each of these libraries to really come up with a process that ensures that their users have access to print materials and now digital, right? Print to digital. And so I think there's going to be more resource sharing opportunities, um, whether that's in special collections. So how do you scan uh, a material in high quality or a 3D object and then send it to a user from another side of the world who is working on their dissertation and needs needs this like to look at it or double check something. So I think there's definitely going to be impact that we, we'll see I mean, resource sharing that will be elevated because at the end, as Tarita mentioned, not it's not as collective as it was before. Not I mean, it's not as individual as it was before, where one library can buy everything, right? It's 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 not that way. Every library needs to partner in terms of advocating for. Um, these resource sharing agreements in advocating for copyright and advocating for a whole bunch of um, areas that are um, overlapping one another. And I think resource sharing is one way that uh, could bring a lot of libraries together that they won't be challenged in budget wise on what to order and whatnot. So this is going to sound a little broken recordy, but very similarly, um, I'm excited about those opportunities that the collaborations and partnerships that we that have already taken shape and that you know even Ray was reflecting on um, uh, will hopefully expand in the future. Particularly those that will then expand the rich array of resources that we individually have at our libraries and then collectively can have. Right, the new systems that we can use to, to further integrate or even crosswalk content um, and workflows around the different types of licensed or even open source tools that we're using. Um, I'm also excited that there's been a lot more attention and collective movements um, that have helped to put increasing pressure, um, particularly on accessibility um, for vendors and with collection materials. Um, that's also pretty uh, encouraging across um, different libraries and consortia. Um, there's absolutely more work to do on that front, sure. Um, but I, I do feel some hope that the alliances and coalitions, some of which I think are named in our chapter, have sprung up and helped to push what should be a fundamental part of our processes and our collections, rather than something that's kind of treated as an afterthought needing um, repair or remediation. So I'm excited um, for those sorts of movements as well. Thank you so much. And as we think um, back to the past um, decade, what do you think has had the biggest impact on libraries? Yeah, I can jump in here. Um, we can uh, ping pong off each other this way. Um, I, I guess it could be really easy to name technology, right? Um, and so I and I agree with that. Um, but I think um, it's also about what we have historically chosen to consider as part of a quote unquote libraries collection, right? Um, and what we've decided should be accessible or how we've provided um, users access to different materials. Um, so that includes, of course, like the physical access to things, but but digital as well, such as those that um, uh, Ray mentioned earlier. Um, but whilst, what has that looked like and how is it that we've used our systems to provide that digital access? So has it just been through licensed materials, um, digitized materials that we've made available maybe just through a web browser, um, requiring various plugins, et cetera? Um, looking to the future, could that also include things like the virtual reading rooms, um, audiovisual materials? Um, and will, will there be potentially digital divide issues um, that spring up if we provide it just through a certain medium? Um, I appreciate what uh, Ray mentioned earlier, which I think is also in the chapter, um, uh, but thinking about you know uh, future, uh, maybe this is a little bit more to the next decade than the, the previous one, but thinking about in terms of physical materials, um, other physical manifestations, which could include things like the more tactile 3D prints and facsimiles and such. Um, so again, I think it's just historically, um, what is it that we've considered a collection and how is it that we've also provided access to that? Um, Ray, what do you think there? <laughs> 
Yeah, I agree. It's it's really the technology uh, over the past decade, and I'm pretty sure maybe some of your uh, chapter authors also may say that because it's about the the technology that enables people to access content and to preserve that content online that's feasible, accessible, so people can feel connected and and have um, a way to access obsolete formats too, uh, from VHS, CDs, even before right, laser disc like and and um, films on nitrate. Like, how do you preserve and access these materials and then turn them into something that has been um, reimagined maybe on TikTok or some other social media channel that people are are using seeing black and white photos or footage into color that people are using because of AI and other technology. But I also want to add um, briefly, it's the the partnership, the MOUs that really make it happen. Partnering with vendors, partnering with other colleagues, partnering with specialists and other libraries. That's what's been really having a big impact. I don't think any of these things were were possible if it weren't for these partnerships um, because it, when you have more people coming together, working on something to advance some sort of uh, uh, a content or, or whatnot, it really um, creates opportunities to see things differently. And, and I think um, there, there's not one group that's like doing everything, right, without some sort of partnership um, or f- that's funded, right? That's even, even getting f- grants requires partnerships or it needs to demonstrate evidence of partnerships. So as they say, you know, um, teamwork is dream work. So I see a lot of that impact um, in libraries that's been happening over the decade. Thank you. And yes, some of these themes have come come through uh, through some of the other chapters as well related to technology and partnerships. And so it's good to hear this come up again in this context as well. Um, I was wondering if you could also talk about, you sort of touched on this already, but if there's anything more you wanted to add with regard to what you think will have the biggest impact on libraries in the, in the next decade. Yeah, um, again, I think, and I'm going to be a little bit optimistic here again, but I think if we're really mindful about what collaborations and partnerships and support that we're mutually providing um, to each other, and in particular the, um, for the communities that we want to serve um, and how we intentionally and critically approach this work, um, there could be really great impacts on what the corpus of knowledge um, looks like in the decades to come. So certainly consortia, um, cross-institutional collaborations, community archives, even in collections, and in general, a growing sense of community advocacy has the potential to really open up access to collections and opportunities for so many library users, um, including those with maybe historically fewer resources, um, while also helping to bring to the forefront maybe historically underrepresented I- and identities and, and materials, um, both within smaller institutions as well as larger. Um, Just like with the expansion of open access and um, open educational resources, um, as well as, um, as we've been seeing more recently, federal mandates to increase transparency and research data um, to be more publicly available. It also means we have to be really socially responsible in how we think about who is part of these conversations, um, who might be left out who's being provided, again, the infrastructural and financial support to be involved in such open initiatives, um, and then what that supposed openness might inadvertently suggest about the nature of research, who gets to produce, publish, disseminate, and be considered an expert in it, that sort of thing as well. So um, those are a couple of thoughts. Yeah, so I I wanted to add in the next decade, I think the law, hopefully, uh, I know as I mentioned earlier, they tend to be reactive or a little bit slow in catching up. But I think the law will will definitely impact uh, libraries in different ways, uh, whether that's about um, consortium development or ebook pricing, uh, gouging issues that that we're seeing right now, or digital content in general, unfortunately. And so I think there's going to be something where consumers' rights will, will, will sort of come in, and that will be favorable for libraries, in addition to issues like copyright and artificial intelligence, and we're seeing lawsuits happening. So I wonder how that will affect the usage of these tools, right, going forward, and and how are they deemed as quote-unquote fair use, right, to, to what extent, and how libraries can, another way to think of it, uh, maybe loan out ebooks, right, which is in itself been um, a practice, but in some ways contested too. And I think it comes down to looking at how the issues that are happening we're seeing in 2024, like the um, internet archive issue, um, how controlled digital lending, uh, CDL will will play a role um, going forward. Um, It's all based on judicial and amicus briefs, decisions, and and that way it will impact 
it could it could scale things or differently and impact how we sustain these collaborative works too um, through technology. Great, thank you. And uh, I was wondering, it's been a few months since you submitted your draft chapter for the book. I was wondering if any of your thinking has changed since you've written the chapter. Yeah, I'll start off first. Uh, that's a great question, Sandy. And for me, when when you had reached out about this edited collection and, and you wanted us to focus on this topic, I was excited, thank you. And then I immediately just like, like wrote, wrote this out right away. I think Tarita could be my uh, witness there and, and, then, and then sort of like work with me to think through some of these issues because it's so exciting to see all, all these things that, that I'm, I'm seeing right now in my work as a solo librarian supporting teachers and grad students and how all these issues like open access is impacting the work I'm doing. But I think um, I've, it certainly has changed uh, slightly. It feels differently, uh, but I will say that um, libraries and research will continue focusing on collections and services, and, and not one library can do that, as I mentioned, that was done decades ago. But some will, will maybe try to do that. Maybe they'll get, have some huge endowment or resources, but they, they alone cannot affect or impact policy changes. That's what I um, say. I've been thinking about that issue, so I didn't mention as much in the chapter, but that's what I wanted to emphasize. Um, in some ways, it's, it's changed that you, it just cannot change. Uh, one, one institution cannot make that change. You need to collaborate and cooperate with others, uh, especially the low, less resource institutions to make these favorable changes that benefit all. And I think um, to a certain, certain extent, I, I, I'm thinking more about the digital content and how it's just increasing uh, in terms of use uh, pricing and how usage may be um, may see not necessarily that return on investment necessarily. So uh, we'll see what, what happens there. But I know there's a lot of um, discussions uh, to be had in the legal scene about um, ebook pricing and stuff like that. But but that's that's what I'm thinking about now. Yeah, it's so funny, this question, Sandy, because um, the funny thing is now looking back on some of the ruminations that, you know, even we were, had been talking about early in the chapter, even as we were finishing it, I feel like things could very much change in 2025, let alone 2035, right? Um, and so while I think some of what was proposed was how, you know, we might be able to share and loan materials across institutions, I think we were very uh, optimistic in a lot of um, what we wrote there. Um, I could also see some challenges, um, uh, depending on the tools, technologies, the vendors and publishers that are involved, especially should more of them consolidate, um, which we've been seeing a lot of lately as well. Um, and so I think about for those smaller or less resource distributors in particular, um, they could face their own budgetary or other restrictions. I hear inflation is a thing these days. Um, and understandably um, may have their own concerns, even partnering maybe with larger institutions who may have historically been more extractive of their materials and their communities as well. Um, so the more opportunities that there are for us to expand and advance, the more opportunities there are also to potentially create or further enhance issues around access, privilege, digital divide, as mentioned earlier. Um, so again, I think that's also why that cultural humility is so important in how we're thinking about our work and what we might be explicitly or inadvertently um, be building or restricting in the process. So... <laughs> Yeah, so it's, there's a lot of complexity and it is changing all the time. I was wondering, do you have any advice for information professionals as they as they look toward the future, the next 10 years? Yeah, so on one hand, um, uh, upskilling for the, the competencies and skill sets that we're looking um, and going to need in the future, especially around technology and data and data management and that sort of thing um, could, could certainly be important. Um, but I think what I'll emphasize again is that I think we need to be um, really applying a critical lens to all of this work. So increased transparency, interoperability, shared collections and even efficiencies um, through the partnerships and tools um, such as AI um, are on the surface really powerful and have the potential to really expand um, what content is available. And certainly we're seeing folks already upskilling within um, areas such as AI and, and, and what have you. Um, but again, you know, as, as budgets continue to shrink, as costs continue to rise, and that includes not just financial costs, but I think about the cost of time, personnel, labor, et cetera. I think we need to be really thinking 
creatively and equitably about how is it that um, we can support the academic and research landscape in a way that doesn't, um, again, further elevate the same type of historically um, uh, homogenous voices and narratives that we often see. Um, so I think um, building those skills, but coming at it um, from that kind of um, equity um, minded lens, I think is going to be really important. So what do you think, Ray? <laughs> Yeah, I totally agree. And you mentioned AI and the the, the skills there. Um, it makes me think about how the future competencies people will need to be comfortable with these technologies that are in the consumer hands right now. And I know a lot of public libraries are still looking into it. A lot of people still aren't even um, talking or know uh, what ChatGPT is about in the public libraries as I've um, having more conversations with folks. But the idea is that they have to be comfortable with these skills, with these new tools um, that require certain skills, but also knowing the ethical considerations. So we know that data will continue to dominate a lot of discussions in terms of being content, in terms of creating access and, and assessment and so forth. But there needs to be more questions that people need to think about, basic foundational questions. How are data is being collected, who is collecting them and for whom, right? So it gets into this digital or data literacy aspect. And I do believe one area, um, Tarita, you mentioned about um, monopolization of uh, vendors and so forth. I do believe that intelligence and information is important. So that means thinking about the company industry or information, having that um, be available um, to, 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 to look through um, can help you prepare about some of the trends that are happening and particularly for students to think about that um, because it impacts how it'll uh, affect, it'll impact the libraries and, and affect how we, we do things in the libraries um, with these mergers because it will in some ways disrupt. And so I think the competencies of knowing um, these tools, knowing that there are trade-offs, the ethical considerations, and when to raise these issues because these tools are biased and they're in some ways, data brokering, they're, they're collecting data in their different ways, and their terms of service and agreements may not be favorable to libraries. So having the, uh, some comfort or experience, some experience to look at the terms of service, terms of agreements might be useful too. Great. Um, you've touched on some of this already. So I, I'll just check to see if there's anything more you wanted to add, whether there's anything that information professionals can do to better prepare for their desired future. Yeah, um, I guess I'll offer, oh, and I apologize. I think I should have let you go first. Uh, then for Ray. Um, but I think I'll, yeah, yeah. I um, uh, I, I think I'll pivot ever so slightly in that. So we've talked a little bit about collaboration um, across the board and you know partnering with other communities, but I think um, we also need to be thinking about um, how we're doing it individually amongst ourselves. So I think about um, in terms of um, building collaborative and inclusive anti-oppressive facilitation skills, um, both at large scale, but again, individually amongst ourselves and how we're working together. Um, how is it that we're bringing people to the table and providing the conditions that empower them to participate, have power and influence in these, in these bigger conversations, I think are going to be really key for um, us to be able to um, again, be those collaborators and build coalitions that are improving um, things um, for um, for more than just ourselves locally, right? And so earlier we mentioned things like um, the coalitions around accessibility and what have you. So um, certainly sort of seeing where those advocates are coming together and getting out of our silos, I think is going to be really important um, for us to uh, more collectively drive a lot of what we want to see in the future going forward. Um, apologies again, Ray. <laughs> No, you're, you're fine. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I agree with everything you're, you're saying there. And I think uh, being comfortable to have these uh, conversations, there's going to be a lot and it's it sometimes are going to be easier than other times, but most time I think it'll be really difficult conversations and looking outside of libraries and information professions too. There, there are definitely a lot of things happening um, in other sectors that we, we, we can might learn from that might be helpful to think about um, our situation uh, in different ways. Thank you. you and Ray, you had uh, mentioned already some key competencies that you think that librarians will need to thrive in 2035, um, but maybe you um, want to check and see if there's anything additional that you or Tarita wanted to add. 
Yeah, I think um, we, yeah, we certainly mentioned that in the beginning. Um, I think there should be definitely more um, data ethics and cultural humility skills and opportunities to um, bring that into their focus as information professionals, as uh, librarians to think about how the content and data can impact um, their own way and, or thinking or create um, issues if, if they don't address it in terms of how do they provide access. And so I think there's going to be um, a lot of these uh, soft skills um, that will continue to con uh, will continue to be part of um, growth and learning. So I kind of want to touch up upon those um, issues. Um, what do you think, Torita? Yeah, again, I'm going to be another broken record here and just echo what you said, because um, uh, I think I will always say that cultural uh, competency and humility will continue to be um, important, um, well, competencies, um, not only because it's never a sort of one and done sort of thing, but also because things like even language, social conditions and identity is always changing. Um, so we really do need to be humble in recognizing that we need to keep reflecting and growing, um, as Ray mentioned, um, and that we not only have to continue learning, but we may be having to unlearn some things as well, because even what seems like a really equitable um, system or collaboration right now might actually reveal an unanticipated um, barrier um, in hindsight when we look back on it. So continually to um, continuing to engage in that critical space um, and building upon that, I think is going to be really important in any field, um, but in any way that we also just naturally work and interact with each other. Yeah, I, I also wanted to say, um, in addition to that, the accessibility that's all connected, that, that the technology is changing. How are we ensuring that those who may be identifying as people with disabilities or a disabled person have access to that too? And, and, and I think it's, it's, it's going to be important to partner with um, vendors and, and, and know how to have those communications, right? And raise those flags and ensuring that um, other groups are aware that um, accessibility is really important. Well, I have one last question for you before we conclude this uh, webcast, and that is if I'd like to um, see what you, how you define your view of the future of libraries uh, in six words or less. Maybe I'll go first for this one. Take one day at a time. <laughs> That six words? Yes, that's six words. I, I say this because there's so many changes and, and you could just, you have to take it one day at a time. Excellent. Now I'm going to have to do that count too because I realize the thing I wrote down, is it actually six words? Let me see. Uh, be mindful and intentional around access. Yeah, okay, I hit that. <laughs> um, because of course, libraries are um, all about access in to information. But again, we need to take that time to also pause and constantly reflect and be thoughtful and critical in how we think about and approach um, our work around it. Um, from those infrastructures that, we'll, or, um, that we're building today and the systems we're adopting to the people themselves um, who are involved in influencing such systems. Um, so, yeah. Well, thank you both, uh, Ray Pun and Tarita Anantachai. Um, thank you so much for joining me today and also for your contribution to Library 2035, Imagining the Next Generation of Libraries. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you today and to hear both of your visions about the future of libraries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sandy, and thank you, Tarita. Yeah, thank you both. Um, it's always a joy to get a chance to chat um, with Ray also, so I appreciate the opportunity. <laughs> and thank you for attending the webcast with Raymond Pund and Tarita Anantashai, co-authors of Chapter 16, Collaborative Collections and Content Considerations in Research and Academic Libraries, Possible Pathways by 2035. To view additional author webcasts from this Library 2035 webcast series, please visit the link or use the QR code on your screen. And thank you again for attending. <laughs>